Hi, everyone. This is Jason Bjork of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest. She is CEO and Director of Quill Intelligence now. They have just had their one-year anniversary for their newsletter launch. She also wrote a very popular book a couple years ago called Fed Up, an insider's take on why the Federal, on why the Federal Reserve is bad for America. She worked nine years at the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas, and she worked on Wall Street, and she's a top Bloomberg columnist. She also has won, uh, she's won awards for LinkedIn for the, one of the top voices in economy and finance for the third year in a row. And she's just one of the best writers in the entire financial industry. She's a breath of fresh air to, a, unfortunately, a somewhat boring industry. So, Danielle DiMartino Booth, thank you for joining me again. I'm happy to be here. Now, Danielle, I want to talk about the U.S. consumer. So how would you describe the state of the U.S. consumer right now? Well, I, I think U.S. consumers uh, are a bifurcated cohort. We, we talk about the inequality divide all the time, and we refer to uh, you know, the haves and the have-nots, and we always think about that in terms of income. But if you think if you think about where rents are and what rental inflation has been in recent years and, and how expensive it is to buy a car, even a used car, used car prices have been very strong as well. So I, I think that the state of the U.S. consumer is, 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 again, it's bifurcated. There are those who have, there are those who have not. Um, for those who are, who are, who are stretching themselves, uh, you know, paycheck to paycheck type people, the cost to service their debts has increased at a very fast rate in the past few months. This is just kind of a byproduct of the Federal Reserve tightening interest rates. Obviously, they haven't started to cut yet. But, uh, but for people whose budgets are constrained, these are very hard times. And I think that that's why we have seen uh, you know, some, some increases in, in automobile delinquencies. I, I think that, that we're going to start to see more and more stress come out of the consumer sector, and that is something that I don't think ha a lot of people have factored into their outlook uh, going forward. Yeah, I totally agree. President Trump keeps repeating that this is the greatest economy ever, but I don't see a lot of evidence of that, especially in the data that comes out. I do see, you know, these surveys for U.S. consumer confidence, and they seem to be, I would say, overly optimistic or hopium. But the data, when you look at the data, in 2018, correct me if I'm wrong, there was an enormous increase in credit card debt, right? So there was people's bills were going up for rent and food and other expenses, health care, and people made up the difference with just an enormous increase in credit card debt in 2018. I think it was over $800 billion in additional credit card debt. Well, and you know, there was something else going on in 2018. Sometimes, and this is somewhat counterintuitive, but there are times when households take on more debt uh, because they think that their incomes are going to grow. And this was kind of the sad state of affairs in 2018. You had some households who were already getting squeezed, you know, those, those layoffs in, in, in the retail sector. We, we don't talk about them much because they're just kind of going on in the background and just kind of this continuous, uh, this continuous parade of pink slips. Uh, but there are plenty of people who are using the credit cards for necessity purchases. But in addition to that, and perversely, counterintuitively, we had so many minimum wages kick in in 2018. And in addition to that, we had the tax cut. So what happened was a lot of Americans saw their paychecks increase, and they thought to themselves, this is fantastic. But unfortunately, the way households think is, if I'm making more, I can spend more. That's simply the way of this country and the way that it's been for a very long time. And then tax season came. I promise there's, 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 a, there's an end to this story. And then the tax season hit, and H&R Block uh, conducted a survey and asked Americans if they had been setting aside extra income throughout 2018 to account for the changes in the withholding tables. And as it turns out, only 20% of, of, of those surveyed had set aside extra money. In other words, 80% were unprepared for the tax refund that they thought that they were going to get or for not paying taxes and then having a tax bill all of a sudden. 
So the reason that we've seen such an abrupt um, weakening in, in the consumer in 2019 is because it started with tax season when a lot of people had been budgeting for and spending money as if they were going to get the tax refund or they were not going to be paying the taxes that they paid, and then they got the rude awakening. So I think that that's something that has been missed on a lot of, 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 of the analyses of what's going on in consumption in America. Those are great points. And there's also not a great incentive for people to save right now. There's not the opportunity to earn 5% or 6% in a savings account. Those opportunities are not available. I hear, I don't know about you in your area, in the Dallas area, Dallas-Fort Worth area, but here in the Washington, D.C. metro area, I hear all these radio and TV commercials, and commercials are on our metro train for the Goldman Sachs new Marcus.com online savings account where you can earn like an extra 1%. So that's a, they're making it like it's a really, really big deal that you can get like an extra 1% or so. Yeah, and that is the sad state of affairs when you hear Jay Powell hit the podium in, in Chicago recently and talk about the effective lower bound and see that Fed officials have replaced uh, the term zero lower bound with effective lower bound, meaning there are very serious discussions ongoing at the Fed uh, talking about implementing negative interest rates. And these are the things that we simply do not want to hear when you consider that we make so little on our savings already. The thought of making even less just makes you cringe. Yeah, this is just bad economic theory, and it's playing out in the real world, and I feel like a, like a bad lab experiment, like a bad guinea pig at this point. I know um, negative interest rates have not really worked in Europe. No, they haven't. And, you know, it, 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 if I could just for a moment, I've got a bone to pick. You know, there are people who, if I ever tweet out, for example, you know, this would kill the banking system. If, if we were to impose negative interest rates, look at see what's happened to – financial institutions in Japan and in, and in Europe. And the venom that starts to fly is pretty astounding, as is the ignorance. People are like, well, you know, hell with those bankers. Let them go. And I'm like, you're not understanding. If you know, the, 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 the financial system is the conduit through which monetary policy is supposed to flow, if there's negative interest rates, you're breaking the conduit itself. And if banks can't make any money, then they won't make good loans to good people with good credit. So it's not that we should have no debt, it's that we should have realistic lending practices. I totally agree. So a couple more things on the U.S. consumer I want to ask you about. So I see a lot of evidence when I go to the grocery store, when I go to you know, Walmart or Target or someplace to get consumer staples, things I need. I notice, I guess, what we would call shrinkflation. I'm getting less value for my dollar for more dollars. So it takes me more dollars to buy less amounts of stuff. I notice the portion size of things I buy at restaurants is getting smaller. So is this something that has been going on for a long time now and is accelerating in your opinion? You know, I'm not so sure it's accelerating and I've got four children, so I've got a bird's eye view. Um, But I will say that you do notice things like, I I used to buy a 12 pack and now they, for some reason, have decided to make it into an eight pack. So when, when, you know, I try my best to follow, and, to follow the price of a gallon of milk because, by golly, it's always going to be a gallon of milk, um, to, to, to your point. But there, there are things like the number of Kleenex in a Kleenex box. And, uh, and I completely see what you're saying. I don't know if there is an acceleration of this. I, I, I'm not so sure that you hit a limit at some point uh, if you're the producer where people really start to push back because, I, you know, again, I've got, I've got four kids. When I shop, I make sure that I'm buying the bag that says one pound. And you, just, you keep your eyes open and, and, and you, you shop when they're specials. But I certainly see your point uh, because we have seen it in bits and pieces. And certainly, to your point about, about restaurants, boy, have prices gone up. Yeah, I also think retail is getting squeezed because you have politicians, especially the Democrat ones on TV, demanding higher wages. But then you have the retail stores are getting killed by Amazon. One of the main growth drivers in the U.S. economy is e-commerce and online sales. 
And so a lot of retail stores, we see the headlines, a lot of retail stores are going out of business or closing, and it seems that the main driver is online sales and e-commerce. So this is the, the U.S. economy, the real economy, the bricks and mortar buildings are going through a very painful adjustment now. And to add this in, you know, with the central bankers doing currency devaluation, this is not good for a retailer. And then a, a consumer that's getting weaker, too, that's using more credit card debt. No, it's definitely not. And one of the more problematic things that we've seen is that we've seen a spreading from retail store bricks and mortar layoffs to the manufacturing uh, hubs of, of the country. We, we've got 51% as of the most recent jobless claims data. We've got 51% of, of the states in the country uh, with rising uh, initial jobless claims over last year, if you look at it at a, at, at a four-week basis, and a lot of them are in some of the most populous states that have been the biggest job creators, such as, as Texas and Ohio and New York. They've, got, they've all got rising claims, and a lot of them are in these big manufacturing states. And the reason I bring this up is that you're talking about blue-collar job losses, manufacturing, industrials, even technology in the most recent batch of Challenger Gray and Christmas layoff data, technology was the second biggest category where they were doing layoffs after, after retail, followed by industrials and autos. These are upper middle class, higher paying jobs. They consume more, so when they lose their jobs, it's going to have more of an impact on the overall economy. And as you know, when the overall economy slows, we all suffer. Yeah, and I wonder how that's going to affect President Trump in the 2020 election because he, the narrative that Trump and his administration are spinning is that this is the greatest economy ever. But like you just said, there's data points and there's a lot of real-world evidence that that's not the case. But it's, it's a growing body of evidence as well with every month that we get that you know, the, the big sell-side economists can no longer say, well, gee, this is an aberration. You know, at some point you have to pay attention. Even the New York Fed, Federal Reserve's recession uh, uh, predictability model is, is suggesting that a 30% chance of recession in the next few months. It was 40%, I would remind you, as we were sliding into the biggest crisis since the Great Depression. So I'm not trying to say 30% is reasonable. I'm trying to say we're getting very close to a drop-off point. Morgan Stanley did some excellent work. I will take my hat off to Ellen Zentner. She's a good friend. And she factored in the effect of quantitative tightening on the yield curve to add that extra tightening element in addition to the Fed rate hikes from 2018 and found that the, the, the yield curve adjusted for quantitative tightening had actually inverted as of last December. Well, if you consider the fact that, that stocks and bonds are as overvalued as they were in 1999, in 2000, that means we've got about a 12-month runway between the time of the true inversion and when we go into recession. So we don't have that much longer and or we could possibly look back and, and already be veering into recession as we speak. So I want to transition to another topic, and you covered this extensively in an event recently, I think last month with Jeff Gunlock in New York City. But in your opinion, how did the U.S. corporate bond market get to be this big? Well, I think that the growth is simply a reflection of, of every iteration since Greenspan uh, had established what we know to be as lower for longer with relation to Fed policy. This time, we've been the lowest for the longest. And, and that is where you get the massive amounts of growth. It's because it, you know, the average credit card interest rate in this country may be pushing 17% record levels, but if you're Joe Q CFO at a big company, you've been able to issue debt at some of the cheapest levels in 5,000 years. And so you pile up debt onto your balance sheet because it's like free money. Well, what we've also had, you know, with the central bankers, I would call it financial repression, is they've artificially forced the interest rates lower, right? So the corporations can see not only do they, can they borrow cheaply, but there's also an appetite, whether it's a shell, junk bond debt, or other types of highly um, more risky bonds, that there's an attractiveness for people out there, whether it's the institutional investors or high net worth investors who want yield. So it, it, there's just been an enormous growth in either junk bond debt or near junk, which is triple B. 
Oh, absolutely. And, and that, 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 that's what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to say that if, if the Federal Reserve keeps rates too low for too long, artificially represses borrowing costs, then you're going to set off an entire dynamic, an entire cycle of companies taking out debt that they don't even necessarily need, but boy, it feels good. Um, it, it, can in, it, it can do all kinds of things like make acquisitions that are way too expensive. But let me take this to the extreme. In, the, in, in Europe, the European Central Bank was buying back corporate bonds. There's a lot of chatter about what's going to happen with the next round of Fed quantitative easing. What's it going to look like? Will corporate bonds be included? When you make debt that cheap and then the central bank itself starts to buy the corporate bonds of these companies, then really stupid stuff starts to happen, such as uh, the Bayer, B-A-Y-E-R, the huge pharmaceutical firm buying Monsanto. They may as well have just driven the value of their company into the ground, but I don't think that they would have paid such a high valuation had the debt to finance it, to care of the ECB buying the bonds was not as cheap as it was. So if you want to take malinvestment out way to the edge of the spectrum, go ahead and have a, a central bank start to buy corporate debt. And that is what we call credit easing. And it's even more destructive and damaging in my view than simply the, the lowering of the price of cost to borrow because then you're choosing the winners and the losers and delegating who gets to borrow and who doesn't. And there's, to add to your points there, there's been over $5 trillion in share buybacks since, what, the 2009, 2008, 2009 period. That's an enormous amount. And a lot of that has not been done with free cash flow. It's been done with debt. You know, it's, the figures vary, but I would say the vast majority, we're talking about 75 80% is cash flow, and it's because companies have had a lot of cash on their hands. Uh, so I, I have a little bit different views on share buybacks. Share buybacks have definitely uh, provided the smoke in the mirror in terms of the strength of the earnings growth because if you're reducing your share count, then your earnings per share mathematically must increase. It's simply it's, it's a truism. Um, but where I push back is the whole idea that it's been debt that has funded share buybacks because that really hasn't been the case. Uh, what we did see with repatriation uh, last year was that companies were able to bring money back on shore, and of course they didn't invest in growing their companies and capital expenditures as to the extent that the administration or any politician in any party will tell you that they will. They brought it back, uh, repatriated, brought it back to the United States, and bought even more shares with it, and here's my beef with share buybacks that not enough people talk about. It is de facto insider trading. When you consider that the CEOs of these companies are buying back their own shares and in many cases have these automated uh, sell programs to divest themselves of their own holdings in their company, there's nothing that's more cut and dry, plain vanilla, if you will, when it comes to defining insider trading. And I think that this is something that, that the regulators and the politicians, for that matter, have really missed when it comes to shareholder buybacks. It's not so much the destruction, and the destruction is there. It's not so much the investment that should have been made and wasn't. That is definitely a factor. But there's, a, there's much lower hanging fruit to be had if the SEC would wake up and smell the coffee. The numbers for triple B rated debt are staggering. Triple B rated debt makes up half of the U.S. investment grade bond market index today compared to only 35% in 2006. And triple B rated debt has increased fourfold in the last 13 years to $3.3 trillion outstanding today. So these look like big red flags. I know you've talked about this a lot both on your Twitter and in your other writings about the line, the, the line in the sand, the marginal line, if you will, appears to be triple B and how there's an enormous amount of pressure on the ratings agencies to not downgrade some of these larger publicly traded companies below triple B. There has been. There has been, there, there's been a lot of, of pressure that you speak of, and it, it's quite the shame because we have what I call a tremendous amount of very cuspy debt 
Morgan Stanley did a report, let, let's say that a trillion of the three trillion is really what we should be considering to be more like a junk bond. But I did a recent exercise and I aggregated what we truly consider to be junk in this country. There's, there's this very quiet little cottage industry that's popped up called middle market private debt. It's $900 billion. It's almost a trillion dollar debt market. And these are very sketchy junk bond type of investors who are getting money directly from investors because it's more lucrative to get around the, the underwriting staff of a bank that wouldn't make these companies these types of loans. So there's, there's $900 billion of that. There's $1.1 trillion of true junk bonds. That gets you to $2 trillion. There's another $1.2 trillion of leveraged loans. That gets you to 3.3, 3.2, excuse me. And then you add on top of that the 3.3 you just mentioned. And we're talking about upwards of $6.5 trillion of very cuspy to junk debt. It's a big dollar figure. So I get frustrated when I hear the speeches by Fed officials saying that it's not nearly as problematic in size as the subprime mortgage crisis was all those years ago. And, and are you including the shale oil junk bond debt in there? Because that's massive. I mean, there, I know there's like hundreds of lawsuits against the shale oil companies. There was a book out recently called Saudi America detailing how like the shale oil companies have been lying to investors claiming that they would be profitable every year for the last 10 or 11 years, and many of them don't have any profits. They've been overstating their reserves, sometimes tenfold. So investors' presentations, it would say their reserves were 10 times the amount as what they would report to the SEC. So do you think the Shell Oil deck goes into that, that $6 trillion amount that oh, you just said? Yes, 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 yes. It, it is definitely in there, and as we know, uh, when there was the, the credit crisis in the energy patch a few years back, uh, I think part of the dynamic there, unfortunately, unfortunately for investors, uh, is that private equity is sitting on so much dry powder that they, they saw an opportunity to step in and get anything at remotely close to a fire sale price. But in effect, they ended up keeping a lot of the walking wounded in the oil industry that should have potentially, you know, gone out of business, restructured, taking capacity out of the system. But that didn't happen because there was so much overinvestment uh, be, simply because pension funds have continued to throw billions and billions and billions of dollars of fresh allocations to private equity. They want to collect the fees. They want to make the, the investment. So they, they basically made sure that the energy industry did not get harmed. Yeah, so I think there's an argument, we talked about this earlier, that the Federal Reserve has definitely helped fuel the shale oil boom because they manipulated interest rates lower, and that made investors want to, oh, I can earn 6% if I fund these shale oil companies to drill. But the problem is now the shale oil companies, they need so much capital that they have to raise billions and billions and billions of dollars just to maintain production level. So it looks like that limit, they're hitting that limit now where they can't raise the money that they were able to raise in the past. Well, you know, we, we shall see. I, um, I, I, never, I never underestimate the, the greed of private equity to come in and save companies that would otherwise go out of business so that they can continue to pay themselves. So we'll just have to say to be determined and, and circle back on that in a year here. So General Electric, Danielle, was, I'd say, the first victim of, you know, over-borrowing too much money. GE had good assets. They had a good amount of revenues and cash flow, but they had used so much debt for financial engineering that when the revenues fell, they got in trouble. So do you think there's going to be a lot more types of um, similar examples to General Electric in the near future? Well, I, I, think one, I think we need to keep one thing in mind, and that is that General Electric is in some ways uh, a very distinct and unique example because they had so much debt. It was, it was well over $100 billion. Um, and, and we find out things like you know, the CEO had a, an extra private jet behind his private jet just in case his private jet ran into mechanical difficulties so he didn't have to be troubled. So you, know, you, you hear things like that and you say to yourself, they deserve the downgrade. Um, and, and, but 
I, I think to your point, it's not so much that there are necessarily a bunch of big, great big GEs out there, but there are definitely a lot of companies that would not be able to withstand one or two quarters in a row of negative earnings and their ability to service the debt even if they're not near as big as GE, it doesn't matter. Their ability to service the debt is that much more constrained because they have versus their earnings capacity versus their ability to generate free cash flow. They've just taken on too much debt. So why do you think then that Jerome Powell did a 180 around December-ish and reversed? Because he was trying to do the right thing. He was trying to raise interest rates. He was trying to reduce the balance sheet, which many people agreed with, and then all of a sudden it just stopped. So what do you think was his rationale for caving in and reversing? Well, I think that it goes – I actually thought you were about to ask me about that when you brought up General Electric. Uh, <laughs> General Electric, yeah, I, that, that, that's what started the process. I mean, there's always, there's always a first domino to fall. And Halloween 2018, Moody's came out and downgraded the, the debt of General Electric within 14 days. I, I can tell this story in my sleep at this point. Within 14 days, the junk bond market had gone into a deep freeze. There were no bonds issued for 41 days. That's a record in U.S. history. And redemptions for high-yield bond funds, ETFs that have zero liquidity, these bonds trade by appointment only during times of stress. So redemptions uh, spiked, spreads over comparable treasuries, gapped out. International regulatory agencies took notice because there was this sudden, sudden stop in liquidity that threatened to become contagious. And that is not something that the Federal Reserve can address. They can, they can placate stock market investors all day long in their sleep by, you know, with Fed speak, but they cannot, cannot contain credit market volatility if it ever is unleashed. And I think that that is what caused the Powell pivot. It was not some Christmas Eve bloodbath in the stock market, but rather what was happening in the stock market was a reflection of what was happening in the bond market because the, the, the bond market vigilantes on the corporate side, if you will, had said, you know what, it's time to pay attention to your balance sheet. And paying attention to your balance sheet is code for you're not going to be able to piss, mini, piss money into the wind anymore on share buybacks. You need to start taking this debt down and battening down the hatches and preparing for an economic slowdown by paying attention to, the, to your balance sheet. So it was a transmission mechanism from a freezing up in liquidity in the credit markets that translated into the stock market that threatened to become a cycle that fed off of itself. That is what caused the Powell pivot. And you talked in a recent interview on Hedgeye about how everything is all about liquidity now. So the central bankers or the Treasury Secretary, if they're having emergency meetings about the corporate bond market or junk bonds, they're worried about providing excess liquidity. But with the cases of some of these corporations that have overborrowed, it might be a case of solvency. So liquidity might, uh, is probably not going to be able to solve the solvency problems of some of these corporations that have overborrowed or have too many outstanding junk bonds. Well, again, um QE was able to uh, save quite a few companies, and I think right now that, that central bank officials know that they're in a race against time so that they can get in front of these insolvent companies that you cite going under. So that is why there is you – know, Powell's going kicking and screaming. There's no June rate cut. That's fine. But I, I think that the pressure – to begin the rate cut cycle and to get to the zero bound so that you can launch quantitative easing again is tremendous so that you can force these junk bond markets to stay open and refinance the 37% of debt that's coming due in the junk bond market just here in the next four years. So the pressure is on these central bankers to dive deeper into unconventional territory in order to prevent companies that should otherwise go out of business from doing so. Yeah, I was going to ask you about rate cuts in QE soon. You, you said you don't expect a June rate cut, but it looks like the market was the, the Fed fund futures is starting to price in a couple rate cuts, but you don't expect them immediately then? 
No, I think that uh, there's, there's too much communicating to, to, to happen. So we need at least one press conference where Powell can explain the Fed's thinking in terms of why it, it is pivoting in the face of what it, even the Fed continues to say we have a very strong, stable economy. So they have to stop quantitative tightening at some point. You don't have quantitative tightening, quantitative easing going on at the same time. So they have to stop quantitative tightening. They have to, they would prefer to broadcast the fact that they're going to be vigilant in, in monitoring the economic data and that, that a rate cut is now on the table if that's what is warranted. But I think that July is the soonest that we would see something, and I know that they're, they're, the hope at the Fed is that the rebound in the stock market has bought them enough time and confidence to get to the end of quantitative tightening as they'd originally scheduled in September and be able to wait until then to have that first rate cut. I just don't know that they're going to have that time. And I just watched the President Trump interview on CNBC a couple days ago, and I've watched his other speeches and comments. It looks like to me, Danielle, that he's trying to reframe everything to place the blame on the Fed for hiking rates in the first place, and that's why the U.S. economy is slowing down. That's why the official government statistics, uh, I don't know if we're officially in a recession, but it's coming in the near future with the inverted yield curve and the other things. It's only a matter of time. Well, it's interesting to listen to the president. You know, you, you can go back as far as the history of, uh, of the Federal Reserve, and presidents have always uh, strong-armed the Fed. Lyndon Baines Johnson threw William McChesney Martin up against a wall at his ranch in Texas. You know, it's like you, you, can't, you can't be tightening while there's boys dying in, in Vietnam. Some presidents have been much more circumspect, obviously, if you go back in history, and Trump has by far been the most public with his condemnation of Fed policy. But the fact of the matter is the U.S. auto industry, which is the most leading of all uh, sectors in the U.S. economy, the U.S. car industry was technically in recession in September 2017 when Hurricane Harvey hit. And that was followed by the tax cuts, which gave a jolt to corporate earnings. Uh, and that was followed by the threat of tariffs, which, which caused a big, huge wave of panic buying on the part of companies that were concerned uh, that, that prices were going to go up, so they, they, they built up tremendous amounts of inventory and stockpiles. All I'm saying is that the, 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 the economy that we reference as being the strongest has had three massive, massive, massive uh, forms of stimulus, whether it be Mother Nature, the tax cut, or the panic-forced buying that, that pushed up industrial production last year, trucking, you name it, to such high levels. And we're now seeing the unwind of that because firms are continuing to say, you know what, we're sitting on too many inventories. Therefore, if you look at the future inventories in some of these manufacturing surveys, they're, they're, they're going down, they're contracting at the fastest level in years, meaning I'm Joe Q purchasing manager, we've got too much inventory stockpile, therefore we're going we're gonna to cancel plans to buy out into the future. The sugar highs are wearing off, and President Trump can blame the Fed all he wants. Was December probably a policy error? Should they have hiked in December? Probably not. It was one step too far, but the U.S. economy on a fundamental level had already started to slow in the fall of 2017, and it was rescued by other measures uh, that have absolutely nothing to do with the Fed. To, to Powell's credit, you know, he was left with a really bad deal. Janet Yellen could have been much more aggressive and pronounced and, and, and disciplined in her approach to tightening when there was the bandwidth, when we had economic latitude and could have absorbed more rate hikes and yet she refused to do that. She was afraid of her shadow. It would have left, Jeff, it would have left Jay Powell with a much smaller job when it came to trying to get anywhere near the five and a half average percentage points of easing that the Fed has had going into all of the recessions, if you look back in history, we, only, we don't even have half of that. And it only makes sense that the U.S. would be slowing down as well because the data from all, many other countries in the global economy, whether it's Germany, the South, South Korean economy, Taiwan, 
China, so many other countries, their economy, the data points are bad, that their economies are not doing well. So it would make sense that this would eventually start to hurt the U.S. Yes, I mean, we're not an economy on an island. We're, we're definitely in, in a globally interconnected uh, supply chain, which we've definitely seen exemplified. And this whole idea of decoupling indefinitely is ridiculous. And we have, have seen evidence of, of weakness in, in Germany and China. You know, th- those two economies are definitely feeding off of one another because they, rel- they rely on each other as much as they do for their trade which supports their economy, but you cannot have the largest economy in the world be completely immune if the, the second and third and fourth, if you, know, if you will, because Japan has also slowed. You can't have the other, because we're, we're about 18% of global GDP, you can't have a good chunk of the other 82% of global GDP slow and be completely immune indefinitely. It just doesn't work that way. Yeah, I totally agree, especially when about 70% of the U.S. economy is based on consumer spending, and we spent the first part of the interview talking about how the U.S. consumer is not doing so well right now. That's absolutely right. You have, you have squared the circle and brought it all back together. Correct. Well, Danielle, I always enjoy our conversations a lot. I want to thank you again for your time. If our listeners want to sign up for your newsletter, tell them how they do so. So just hop on quillintelligence.com. That's all one word, quillintelligence.com. Uh, and it's as easy as one, two, three, and you'll be getting the daily feather in your inbox. And I, I promise you it is some of the, the best, most coherent, forward-looking, economic, and entertaining uh, research that you'll, you'll ever see. And follow me on Twitter at Demartino Booth as well. I also recommend your book, if anyone hasn't read it yet, it's on Audible Audiobook. It's a very interesting look into how things are uh, day-to-day operations at the Federal Reserve. Yes, I, I wish that up was not more relevant as a factor of time. That was not what I thought the case was going to be when we had the first non-PhD since Paul Volcker take the helm, but here we are talking about things like negative interest rates. <sighs> well, we could, I could speak about this for hours more, but I'll, I'll let you go for now. I want to thank you again for your time, and hopefully you'll be back on in the near future. Thank you. I appreciate yours as well. Take care. Please like this video. Share it with friends and family, and don't forget to subscribe to the Wall Street for Main Street YouTube channel if you have not already done so. Thanks for helping Wall Street for Main Street pass the 20,000 YouTube channel subscriber milestone despite YouTube censorship. Hopefully, we'll be able to get to 30,000 or even 40,000 YouTube channel subscribers quickly if YouTube doesn't shut down this channel. If YouTube does shut down this channel, Remember to also sign up for the Wall Street for Main Street email list that's on the wallstreetformainstreet.com website and will tell you where the videos are going to be uploaded instead of YouTube. Also, if you really like the content and you decide that you want to give a one-time donation, you can go to wallstreetformainstreet.com, that's W-A-L-L-S-T-F-O-R-M-A-I-N-S-T.com website where there's different options for you to do so or you can become a Patreon contributor. Thanks for listening, and I look forward to providing my loyal listeners with some of the best information, analysis, and financial education available out there, free or paid, as I work to grow the podcast and also get my educational technology company funded.